story and song. It's good to be here. It's good to be with my friends. It's good to be with you. Um, if some of you are new to this series, um, if I am new to you, let me begin with just a little bit of introduction. I'm Deborah Gerard, uh, founder and lead coach at Be Well, Serve Well which is a wellness initiative where we hope to inspire and inform lives of health, joy, and generosity, being well and serving well. Now this series is about books. I love to read. There's a stack of books in every room of my house, beside my favorite chair, several stacks on my desk. You might be the same way. I wanna be well read and I want you to be well read too. So in this series that we began just about uh, a month ago now in August, uh, I'm sharing books that have had an impact on my life, authors that have had an impact on my life, on my journey professionally and personally towards wellness and wholeness and on my journey towards love, grace and wisdom. Now wisdom brings to mind our recent collective loss of a very wise, generous woman, the notorious RBG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. It also brings to mind some wise words that Mark and Donna here at Story and Song offered all of us in their newsletter this past week. These are some wise steps that they hope that we will take together. Communicate with integrity, honor one another, see obstacles, as opportunities for growth. Express appreciation for the contribution of others. Honor our differences <laughs> and lighten up, lighten up. Now we're gonna be talking about that one quite literally today. Still, the others apply as I begin to introduce Dr. Michael Greger's book, How Not to Diet. I do so very mindful, very mindful that we do not always honor our differences when it comes to how we look, how we eat, how we live, how we choose to take care of ourselves. Anxiety is at a fever pitch in our world. That's an understatement, right? We've created a lot of roads called us and them. Health shaming, fat shaming, food shaming, these are some of those roads. We do this to others, we do this to ourselves. But the spiritual teacher Ram Das had it right when he said, we're all just walking each other home. Today, as I share with you, I hope to walk each of you, each of us, a little closer to home. I wanna review, just show you again, the books that we've talked about so far. Food Rules was the first book we spoke about, Michael Pollan little manual on eaters, um, tips for eaters, food rules. Then a couple of weeks ago, we talked about how not to die. Good idea, right? <laughs> Great book. I hope you tuned in. If you didn't, you can certainly go back and look at the video. It's available on our Facebook page. Today, we're going to talk about how not to diet. Good idea, right? How not to diet. I also want to say a word about these books. Um, we'd like you to look for these books. Uh, if you're in Fernandina, come to the store. It's open. Um, but also, if you're not, and I know I have a lot of folks following us literally from around the world. I'm happy about that. And if you are, you can go online to the Story and Song website and find these books if you're interested in them. Okay, I hope you will. I hope you will. So let's begin. How not to diet. Now, Dr. Michael Greger adds a whole lot of credence to his writing because he's a physician and he's an internationally recognized speaker. He speaks on topics of public health, um, food safety, nutrition. He's also a founding fellow with the American College of Lifestyle Medicines. And he's also, you might have heard me say this last, uh, last time, he's a certified, I certified him myself, nutrition nerd. <laughs> I like that, and he's passionate. He's really passionate about offering evidence-based information to you and to me so that we can then make informed choices, choices about our health, choices about the foods we eat, choices about the lifestyle that we live that then impacts our health. 
And he does this not only through the books that he writes, but also through the nonprofit public service website, nutritionfacts.org, where he has created this website solely for the purpose of sharing the latest scientific nutritional information. It's fascinating and it's free, so I hope you'll check that out. How Not to Diet, Not Unlike How Not to Die, is a labor of love by Dr. Greger. Now you might remember if you were with us last time that How Not to Die was dedicated to his grandma. <laughs> this book, How Not to Diet, is dedicated to his mom. The, the source, he says, of every good thing in his life. I like that. He's got a heart. <laughs> he cares. He really cares too about the trajectory of health in America. And he offers sound evidence-based guidance for us to follow, to get us out of the rabbit hole. What's the rabbit hole you ask? Well, according to Gregor, it's the place where helpful healing information goes to die. It's where resources, resources that are valuable, that could be valuable to us as a public get buried in the medical literature, literature we'll never see. He's taking care of that for us. It's information like the powerful, powerful cure that his grandma found in food to reverse her irreversible heart disease. It was a death sentence. The doctor sent her home to die, but you may remember she lived 31 more years. Gregor begins his book, How Not to Diet, by asking this question. So like heart disease, might there be a cure for obesity? How Not to Diet is his answer to that question. Spoiler alert, yes, absolutely. Now, as you might guess, his answer is found in facts and food, not filler, fluff, or fantasy. These are the words that he uses to describe most diet books that are on the market today. He wrote this book in 2019. It's a relatively new book. And at that time, he said Amazon listed over 30,000 diet books. Whew, that's a lot. No surprise, he's not a fan of those books. He invites us to dig deeper into that rabbit hole, extracting some sound guidance, crawling out to have a solid place to stand, caring for our health, losing weight if we need to, and gaining health in the process. Sounds like a win-win-win to me. Quoting two nutrition professors on the subject of diet books, Gregor writes this, quote, often the loudest, most extreme voices drown out the well-informed. There's also money to be made, end quote. You know, the diet industry breaks in about $50 billion a year, that's billion with a B, and it's a business model, pay close attention, based on repeat customers. I, for one, and I believe Gregor agrees with me, I hope we can stop feeding that industry. Gregor's book is a great place to begin. You see, at any time, uh, any given time in America, upwards of 45 million people are on a diet. And it's estimated that 96% of those who lose weight through quick weight loss plans, many of them with prepackaged foods, need I say processed, we've talked about that, and weekly weigh-ins, 96% lose weight, but only to regain it, and then some, within a year. It's a pogo stick plan, remember, repeat customers, that has us up and down, up and down, and it feeds and fuels this industry. And to me, it's a reflection of a poor relationship with food and body. And that's a shared poor relationship in our culture. Now, the relationship between food and body is one of the issues that I help people navigate when they come to me for healing. Gregor begins by outlining the problem, and he quickly jumps into the fray, saying this, obesity isn't new, but the obesity epidemic is. I'd like to read a little bit from his book for you. Over the last century, obesity appears to have jumped tenfold from as low as one in 30 to now one in three, but it wasn't a steady rise. Something seemed to happen around the late 1970s and not just in the United States. The obesity pandemic took off at about the same time in most high income countries. There's one of the keys. Around the globe in the 1970s and 80s, 
the fact that the rapid rise appeared almost concurrently across the industrialized world suggests a common cause. It would seem that we're carrying the weight of the world, the industrial world, that is. Now, the food industry blames inactivity. It was the CEO of PepsiCo who famously said, if all consumers exercised, obesity wouldn't exist, end quote. That's a deflection of responsibility from my viewpoint. Gregor continues this thread, noting that leaked internal documents indicate that Coca-Cola spent $1.5 billion to create the Global Energy Balance Network to downplay the role of diet in the obesity epidemic, using this front group to change the conversation about obesity in its war, its war with the public health community. That's just sad, and it's irresponsible again. When, as Gregor points out, child and adolescent obesity rates have continued to rise now into the fourth decade. Our children deserve better, we deserve better than this industry tactic and many others like it. One tactic, lean washing. Now, Gregor offers Nestle as the best example, rebranding itself, and I quote, the world's leading nutrition, health, and wellness company. What? Yeah, that's the Nestle that's responsible for uh, Kit Kat, Butterfingers, Gobstoppers, Goobers, Raisinets, you see where this is going, uh, Raisinets, cr Cookie Crisp cereal, you get the idea. Gregor's writing is approachable in part because he brings at least a little humor to this otherwise tragically sad reality. Saying that to him, Nestle is a whole lot more Willy Wonka than wellness. You see, Gregor's right. We live in a toxic food environment. Now, is he saying that when that we are all just victims of this environment and our weight gain isn't a hand to mouth problem? Well, not exactly. What he is saying is this. In this toxic environment, quote, the battle of the bulge is a battle against biology. So obesity isn't a moral failing. We need to hear this. He's spreading salve on our guilt and our shame, our incessant obsession with claiming we are willpower weaklings. We're not. And he continues, quote, I can't stress enough that becoming overweight is a normal, natural response to the abnormal, unnatural ubiquity of calorie-dense, sugary, and fatty foods, end quote. Gregor teaches that this epidemic is less about the quantity of food we're ingesting than about the quality of food, with an explosion of cheap, high-calorie, low-quality convenience foods. He does point out, however, that it becomes about quantity because those foods are designed specifically to feed our cravings for more, quantity. You may recall this phrase from Michael Pollan's book, Food Rules, food-like substances created in labs by scientists. Not real food, cheap, high calorie, low quality, convenience foods. Now these are my words, not his. In workshops and one-on-one -on -one with, with clients, I offer an invitation and I offer you that same invitation today to choose consciousness over convenience. By seeking to be well-read, you're doing just that. I'm glad. Though I knew it was true, I'm certainly not a fan of the fact that I am one among American taxpayers, quote unquote, sweetening the pot, as Gregor so aptly puts it. Allow me to read again. Subsidies are one of the reasons chicken is so cheap. Thanks in part to subsidies, meats, sweets, eggs, oils, dairy, and soda, were all getting relatively cheaper as the obesity epidemic took off. Whereas the relative cost of fresh fruits and vegetables doubled. This may help explain why during the same period, the percentage of Americans getting five servings of fruits and vegetables every day dropped from 42%, still not very high, to 26%. Wow. 
Gregor outlines the problem in copious detail. It's fascinating reading, albeit a bit, a bit frustrating. <laughs> you might be especially interested in a practice known as cliffing. cliffing. This forces companies to bid against each other for prime real estate in supermarkets. You can guess that's eye level shelf place placement of their products. With the loser being pushed off the shelf over the cliff, hence the name cliffing, and out of that prime sight line. Now, Gregor says that slotting fees, as they're called, can be as much as $20,000 per item, per retailer, per city. <laughs> Yikes. And if you're wondering, I doubt you were, broccoli is not one of the items that they're talking about. <laughs> Advertising doesn't help, right? Quote, unquote, Reagan era deregulation removed the limits placed on marketing food on television to children. In addition to the 10,000 food ads children may see on TV every year, there is marketing content online, in print, at school, on their phones, nearly all of it for products detrimental to their health. And there's more. Pediatricians are now encouraged to have the French fry discussion. Who knew that was a thing? At the 12 month well child visit, rather than waiting till the two year well child visit when it used to take place. And even that may be too late, Gregor says, noting that two thirds of infants have been introduced to junk food by their first birthday. Now, if you want me to feel sick to my stomach, I hope you don't, but if you did, send me a photo of a one-year-old making a big mess of that first birthday cake. That little cake that I believe is beginning to make a mess of their taste buds and a probable potential mess of their health long-term. Gregor quickly notes there are obesity skeptics that say that I and Gregor and others are taking the fun out of food, like the birthday cake, I'm sure. And he offers an interesting section called health at any size. I won't elaborate. I hope you'll be curious enough to check it out. The consequences of all this are clear citing the largest study in history on the health effects of being overweight, a study that analyzed data from more than 50 million people in nearly 200 countries. Gregor writes that too much excess body weight accounts for the premature deaths of about 4 million people every year. He calls it an alphabet soup of potential health concerns. A is for arthritis, B is for back pain and blood pressure, C is for cancer, D for diabetes, E for encephalopathy, also known as brain disease, F for fertility issues, G for gallstones and GERD, heart disease, immunity, jaundice, kidney disease. I don't mean to be a bearer of bad tidings, truly, but you see where all this is going. It's not going to a good place. The consequences are clear. But Gregor and I wanna offer you some good news. Here it is, quote, the flip side of this is that even modest weight loss can have major health gains. And Gregor concludes his outline of the problem, this rabbit hole, by pointing out that until political will is such that there is industry-wide change in the food industry, it's up to us, it's up to you and me. It's up to you and me to take back our health to take back our taste buds, to take personal responsibility for our health and the health of those we love. And you know, Gregor's not gonna leave it there. He dives headfirst into laying out ingredients for ideal weight loss. He does this with some creds too. He's, member, he's a member of the US News and World Report Best Diets Expert Panel, tasked with scoring dozens of trending diets on set criteria. And so he's well aware of and intimately informed about the latest diets that pop up every year. That also means he's well qualified to shift from talking about the impact of food industry has on obesity to outlining the impact that the weight loss industry has on obesity. A si significant part of the work that I do is helping people change the way we think 
the way we think about food, the way we think about our bodies, the way we think about health and wellness and wholeness. Gregor's out to change the way we think too, changing the way we think about weight loss, teaching us how not to diet, laying a firm foundation for the healing ingredients that he offers. I wanna list some of those. Ingredient number one is choosing more anti-inflammatory foods. The spiced turmeric is top of the list, followed by ginger and garlic. While eating fewer pro-inflammatory foods, foods high in trans fats, high in saturated fats, the top five most pro-inflammatory foods are cheese, and this is the order, cheese, desserts like that, birthday cake and ice cream, chicken, that one probably surprises you, pork, and then burgers. And when talking about some of these foods that are high in fat, for those of us concerned, as many of us are, about cognitive decline, dementia, Alzheimer's, Gregor offers a fascinating section on the, high, the impact of high fat diets, like the ketogenic diet, on cognitive decline. I hope you'll remember to check that out. Clean foods is another ingredient that Gregor introduces is vital to ideal weight loss. That would quickly eliminate many, if not all, of the pre-packaged weight loss foods sold by the weight loss industry. And Gregor shares this as it relates to obesogenic pollutants, obesity generating chemicals that are in our food supply. Quote, an analysis of chicken feathers found that pult the poultry in industry appears to feed the birds everything from arsenic to Prozac. Poultry producers say feeding caffeine keeps the chickens awake so that they eat more and grow faster. You can't make this stuff up. Discussing clean foods, Gregor also brings the FDA and the CDC into the conversation. I want to read this. The Food and Drug Administration has regulations about toxic chemicals in the food supply, determining the action levels of contaminants above which foods must be removed from the shelves. For those, but those levels tend to be far higher than the levels based on health standards set by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. For example, a glass of milk tainted with the amount of DDT permitted by the FDA would expose a consumer to nearly 10 times the daily exposure considered safe by the CDC. Gregor's ingredient list continues. Fiber-rich foods, foods he describes as comfort food for the colon. Now, I like that phrase. He also includes foods high in water content because like fiber, water adds bulk to foods without adding calories. And as an example, grapes, they have less fiber than bananas, but are significantly more filling because of the water content. If you wanna lose weight, go bananas for a bunch of grapes. Next, Dr. Greger includes in his ingredient list, foods low on the glycemic index, foods low in added sugar, low in added fats. And throughout his book, Greger offers food for thought. That's a phrase I often use when I'm teaching too. I like that. These are small snippets, little tips, helpful practical guidance like this related to sugar. We could all use some tips on sugar, right? Note that none of these recommendations to cut down on added sugar includes fruit. If you randomize people to a diet low in all sugars, even the naturally occurring sugars, they do worse than those randomized to cut down added sugars alone. Those who retained fruit in their diets lost nearly 50% more. That's amazing, it's good news. The ideal weight loss diet is also low in addictive foods and Gregor outlines quickly why pointing out, quote, taste engineers manipulate the salt, sugar, and fat contents of food to achieve what is known in the industry as the bliss point. The bliss point, isn't that lovely? It's the peak of our craveability making us come back for more. And he notes that of the top 15 most addictive foods, every single one is a processed food. 
the 10 least addictive foods, every single one is a fruit, vegetable, or legume. Now, the addiction isn't about taste or flavor. The truth is our taste buds have been hijacked from the time that first birthday cake was put in front of us. You see, the ripest, sweetest peach will taste sour after a bowl of Fruit Loops. But in just a few weeks, we can reclaim our taste buds and reclaim our health. Gregor's ingredient list continues. The ideal diet is low in meat, low in salt, low in refined grains, and low on the insulin index. Here's another interesting note that Gregor offers about insulin. From an insulin standpoint, he says, the worst of both worlds would presumably be the combination of animal proteins and a high glycemic load. Think burger on a bun, meat and potatoes, or a deli meat sandwich. That's the standard American diet, right? It's not working. It's not. What does work? Another ingredient in the ideal weight loss diet is microbiome friendly foods. As Dr. Greger points out, and I quote, the road to health is paved with good intestines. I'm just gonna leave that there for a minute. You may be like my brother by now, asking what in the world do we eat? <laughs> if you were with us for how not to die, you already know the answer. The ideal weight loss diet, eating lifestyle, is rich in fruits and vegetables, rich in legumes. Gregor and his team of researchers are quick to point out some helpful tips on including more fruit, vegetables, all these plant-based foods when, our weight, when weight loss is our goal. Here's an example that relates to eating fruit. This is pretty fascinating information. Just as population studies have found that greater whole fruit consumption is associated with a lower risk of type 2 diabetes, yet more fruit juice consumption is linked to higher risk, consuming whole fruits can facilitate weight loss while drinking fruit juice may promote weight gain. Eat the fruit, skip the juice. And there's this, he talks about high pulp, extra pulp, more pulp, orange juices, they're not significant sources of fiber. He calls that pulp fiction. Gregor even offers a recipe for success chart that can help us analyze our daily choices against this list of 17 ingredients to see how we're measuring up. He wants us to be successful. And remember, he has no skin in this game. Every penny he makes from these books goes directly to charity. Remember I said he has a heart. His skin in the game is the fulfilling knowledge of helping you and me learn not only how not to die, but also how not to diet. Now, I've never been a fan of diets or the word diet. Perhaps it's because when I was in college, I gained that obligatory freshman 15. My boyfriend was attending another college and he signed one of his letters, please diet, Scott. What, seriously? You see our obsession with weight and appearance starts really early. It can be hurtful and harmful. We just don't need the associated guilt and shame. What we do need is to learn how to eat. And I believe Gregor is teaching us just that. Enter his optimal weight loss diet. You knew this was coming, right? Um, Gregor says this, quote, short-term fixes are no match for long-term problems. Lifelong weight control will requires lifelong lifestyle changes, end quote. I teach lasting lifestyle changes, Gregor does too, as he describes the four necessary components that must be considered as we learn how not to diet. The optimal weight loss diet must be sustainable, safe, nutritionally complete, and life extending, what a friend of mine and I call life giving, life giving. Sustainable. Now, a water-only fasting diet is 100% effective, and it is 100% unsustainable. 
right? Safe. We all know people who lose weight without gaining health. It's not safe. And we see it all too often in the youngest among us who begin early to struggle with eating disorders. Nutritionally complete. Now, a vegan diet can be nutritionally incomplete if a person is choosing highly processed vegan foods, food like substitutes, and not including a food like nutritional yeast, which is high in vitamin B12. This is why I say I'm not a vegan. I have a whole food, plant-based eating lifestyle. It's nutritionally complete. And finally, the eating lifestyle we develop must be, must be life extending. Otherwise, what's the point? What's the point? As Dr. Greger teaches us how not to diet, he continues to teach us how not to die. Wrapping up his book and my introduction of his book are two sections, a section offering weight loss boosters, I like that, and Dr. Greger's 21 tweaks. Each one scientifically scrutinized and extrapolated to offer us the best steps, practical guidance possible. Gregor wants our success. He wants our weight loss, but he also wants our wellness. Among the boosters, you'll find some fascinating topics, including chronobiology. This is the timing of when we eat what we eat. It's akin to eat breakfast like a king or queen, lunch like a princess or prince, dinner like a pauper. Still, Gregor is quick to say that on balance, what we eat is more important than when we eat. Quoting the writer of Ecclesiastes, as I did, when talking about his book, How Not to Die, Gregor aptly points out that when saying there's a time to every purpose under heaven, the writer of Ecclesiastes probably wasn't talking about donuts. Other weight loss boosters, not surprisingly, include exercise, as he asked this question. Does a sedentary lifestyle lead to obesity or does obesity lead to a sedentary lifestyle? It's a good question. If you want the answer or and or some tips for your own exercise regimen, read the book, read the book. Gregor touches on hydration, inter intermittent fasting, how we deal with stress, even our sleep patterns. Now, not wanting to keep you in the dark, I'm gonna share this about how our exposure to light impacts our body's ability to not only to rest and repair, but to lose weight and or gain weight. A study of more than 100,000 women controlled for light exposure and found that the odds of obesity trended with higher nighttime light exposure, independent of sleep duration. It turns out Edison, with his bright idea, not only invented the light bulb, he also invented the ability for us to live our lives 24-7 whenever, wherever, however we choose. I say choose to turn out the lights, all the lights, the charging light on your device, your phone, the night lights, pull down the shades, pull the curtains, hopefully some blackout curtains, unless you live in the countryside where there are no street lights. Gregor also says this, this is pretty fascinating, quote, using satellite imagery, scientists have been able to correlate higher obesity rates with brighter communities, light. Are you getting the, the, getting the picture? I hope so. There's more to weight loss than meets the eye in the mirror, the number on the scale, the products on the grocery shelves, or the portions on our plates. Though he talks about all those too. Dr. Greger does all he can to cut through the confusing, outline every possible step, every possible ingredient that we can employ to help us turn the tide of this pandemic of obesity and unwanted weight in our nation, but also in our own lives. How Not to Diet isn't a book for the faint-hearted. It's a big book, and just like How Not to Die, he's organized it in such a way that it's approachable. He's crafted it with bite-sized pieces that you can read, digest a little bit, come back, read some more. Gregor and his team of researchers, 115 of them, named in the back of the book, they're thorough, they're passionate, they see the problem, and they offer science-based, evidence-based, practical guidance to help us collectively and individually solve that problem. How Not to Diet is a book for the wholehearted, and I believe that's you. 
wholeheartedly seeking not only to be well read, but to be well, truly well, and to serve well too. I hope so. Early in the book, Dr. Greger says this, I feel so blessed to be able to dedicate my life to helping people while doing what I love, learning and sharing. I can't imagine doing anything else. I can't either. I give thanks for every opportunity, including this one, to help people heal, to share what I've learned. I suspect someone within the sound of my voice today is hurting. Perhaps hurting because my introduction of this topic, obesity, weight loss, dieting, has opened some old wounds, maybe chron chronic wounds. Hurting because of unwanted weight. Hurting because of disease related to unwanted weight. Hurting because of health shaming or food shaming or fat shaming. Hurting because of a poor relationship with food and body. I know you know it wasn't my intention to hurt, though I believe the hurt is real. I know it is. And I also believe that you're not alone. My intention has been to offer a resource in this well-researched, well-written book, How Not to Diet. I'm here as a resource too, and I hope you'll reach out. My intention is to help you heal. You can private message me on Facebook. You can contact our friends here at Story and Song. They know where to find me. Let's talk. We're in community, we're building relationship, and we are all just walking each other home. Now next month, I'll be back with two more books, two of my favorites, sharing some compelling true stories of healing and hope. In the meantime, I hope you'll like and follow both the Be Well, Serve Well page and the Story and Song page. Remember, it's B with two E's because in Hebrew, my name means worker B. And I hope you'll join us next month. Until then, be well read, be well and serve well, and I'll do the same thing. Thank you for joining us.